So glad to have a house full to have you all here this morning on this beautiful Lord's Day. We're going to begin our time together by offering praise and worship to the God who is worthy of our praise. Let's stand as we sing, Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord, he is holy and just. By his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true. By his mercy he proves he is love. Great is the Lord and worthy of glory. Great is the Lord and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice. Now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of glory. Great are you, Lord, and worthy of praise. Great are you, Lord, I lift up my voice. I lift up my voice. Great. We are currently in a series of studies about suffering. Why do bad things happen in this world? Why do Christians suffer? Why do we have trials that we have to face? Many kinds. But more importantly, where do we turn in those times of trials? Who do we turn to to help us through those? We're going to be singing some songs that uh, remind us of God's care for us through any kind of situation. I wanted to start by reading a scripture from the psalm, and this is when David was going through a time of trial and uh, turned his thoughts to the Lord and turned his thoughts to music, to hymns of praise to God. This is Psalm 40, beginning with verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. my 
have him to turn to in times of trouble. We are grateful that he knew what trouble was, that Jesus came to this earth to experience what we experience, and then paid the ultimate price, his sacrifice for our sins. We want to come to this time in our service as we do every Lord's Day, where we gather around his table, we partake of emblems that remind us of his sacrifice for us, and because of that, we have hope. We have the hope of eternal life. We have the hope that sustains us through this life. We have several visitors here today, and we want you to know all Christians are welcome when we share in the Lord's Supper. Jesus is the one that invited his followers to do this. All Christians are welcome. Donnie's in the back. If you did not pick up a communion chalice as you came in this morning, just raise your hand, and Donnie will bring those to you. We want everyone to be able to share in this time, this special time of the Lord's Supper. Just raise your hand if you need a communion chalice this morning. We'll be singing a song that is one of inner reflection, where we look at our own lives and we ask the Lord to cleanse us of anything that we have going on in our life, as we know he can because of his sacrifice for our sins. After we sing this song, we'll have a time of meditation by B.A., time of prayer, and I'll return and we will um, all partake of the emblems together. Let's sing this song, a favorite of many, Cleanse Me. Search me, God, and know Savior, no 
The Bible reveals that the world empire of ancient Egypt was shocked and stunned when they woke up one morning and uh, every single firstborn child in their entire land, along with the firstborn of all of their livestock, was dead, dead. Not only that, 600,000 Israelite men and in addition to that, their wives and their families were all singing their way down the road to freedom. When they realized what was going on, they started saying, what happened, what happened? And they saw one piece of very mysterious evidence on the doorposts, the doorways of all the dwellings of those Israelites, there had been painted the blood of many, many slain lambs. The Egyptians were filled with grief, of course, because of the loss of their loved one, but they were also filled with rage. And so they said, they will not get by with this. We will go after them. We will bring them back. We will make them pay. But of course, you know the rest of the story. And you and I should know how we fit into the later fulfillment of that story by way of the suffering and the blood giving of Christ, our Lamb. The whole Bible presents the significance of the blood of the Lamb. No time to go into all kinds of scriptures today. Just maybe sum it up with a statement that John the Baptist made when he saw Jesus coming toward him and he addressed the crowd and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The book of Revelation puts a climactic and very, very meaningful explanation point on this whole subject of the Lamb of God. In chapter 4, we see the throne of God, too majestic to even put in human words. And in chapter 5, we see in the center of the throne a Lamb like it has been slain. And all creation is serving and walking before him and bowing and being judged by him. Even Pharaoh will see him along with all of us. And we will know that his slaying, his giving, his blood was the most powerful victory that this world has ever known or ever experienced. And then the whole creation will fall at his feet and they will sing this new song, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. Oh, one more thing. The Lamb who was slain has invited you and me to this table today to remember, to reflect, and to rejoice. Dear Father, I pray that you will help us comprehend the depth of your gift the length of the time that you prepared and carried it out, the ultimate climactic moment when we will see you for who you really are 
our salvation, the one who loves us, not wants to make us your slaves. You want to make us your sons and daughters by way of your blood. We thank you. In Jesus' name. times when I wonder if any of my prayers are getting through. He knows what I need before I ask. This much I know is true. Maybe one day I'll discover spoken words to be more real. But Lord, right now to know just how I feel No more words to say No more promises to make Hear my heart When I don't have strength to try And when I do it's with a sigh Hear my heart You know every fear and every doubt I cannot face. You know all the ways I need you and all the ways I'm weak. So I'll be quiet now. Lord, please hear my heart. Every now and then When I hear a Christ-like song or melody It comforts and it quiets It fills me up and speaks to me Far above a life of struggle I think might never end all oh, his songs Brings me close to him. No more words to say, no more promises to make. Hear my heart. When I don't have strength to try, and when I do, it's with a sigh. Hear my heart. You know every fear and every doubt I cannot speak. You know all the ways I need you and all the ways I'm weak. So I'll be quiet now. Lord, please hear my heart. I'll be quiet now. First John 4.4 4 says, But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won the victory over those people, because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. With all the uncertainty that's going on in the world, it's comforting to know that we've already won the battle. Let us pray. Christ, Jesus Christ, thank you so much for the love that you gave to us when you came down to be with us to die for our sins. We're unworthy of it, but your mercy is so great and so wonderful in your love for us. Lord, we just pray for 
our world right now, the turmoil, the uncertainty, the unrest. God, we just pray that you will continue to bless us and help us to be the light in your world that shines. God, thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. Be with Larry as he gives this message today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Scott Greer began his sermon saying cancer is terrible. Uh, I would like to share with you about the story of Laney Ann Watkins. Here's a picture of Laney and her paternal family as they were gathered, you know, in, in just greatness and joy. And they were excited to be together. And, and Brandon and Tessie had welcomed Laney into their life on March the 12th, 2009. Laney was a very ambitious little girl from an early age, and they had cattle, and if, if Brandon went out to feed these cows without asking Laney to go with him, she was very upset, especially with her cow. She was very protective of that. And Brandon would lead our worship at church, and he worked in the parts department at John Deere in Nevada, and Tessie taught school at, at El Dorado Springs, and she also taught our kids in our church, and she was part of our MOPS program, that is the mothers of preschoolers, and everything just seemed to be going the way they wanted things to go until one morning, Tessie noticed that Laney's eyes were crossed. And so she takes her to the local eye doctor, and the local eye doctor said, there is nothing wrong with her eyes. You need to take her to a specialist up in Kansas City, because we think something more severe is going on. And so Tessie gets Brandon, and Brandon and Tessie are on their way to Kansas City, and Brandon calls his sister, who is a nurse at Children's Hospital in Kansas City, and she makes some calls and talks to the doctors and said, you need to forget about taking Laney to the eye doctor. You bring her to the hospital. And through several uh, hours of testing, it was determined that Laney had a brain tumor. And just to give you an uh, idea of the brain tumor, it was two millimeter by eight millimeters as compared to a penny. And this little tumor was not attached, which having worked with hospice, I thought was a great thing because usually if it has legs on it and gets inside the brain, it's hard to remove it. But this was not attached, so I'm thinking, well, yeah, they could probably just take this tumor out and, and uh, she will be okay. Some of you may not know that St. Jude's Hospital in Memphis and next to them, Le Bonner Hospital, they sort of work together with children, especially with doing surgeries. And so the time came that evening on, on uh, February 25th that the Le Bonner private jet flew to Kansas City and they were going to pick up Tessie and Laney and fly them back to Memphis so she could have surgery. And then... She has a surgery. And you can imagine how you are if you've had surgery. You're pretty wore out and tired. And, and Laney was tired. And, and it just seemed like maybe everything would be all right. But they said, well, we need to give her chemo. And she's too young for radiation. So, so that uh, was the direction and the path that they were going to treat Laney. And then one of the things you may not know is when you have surgery as a child at St. Jude's, you get a little red wagon. And this red wagon is so nice because it can carry you around. And, and when you're too tired, you know, your mom and dad can pull you around. And, and th there's just a whole lot of toys there at, at um, St. Jude's Hospital. And, and I remember one time when Joni and I went down there, Laney was there getting chemo, and then she um, finished, and she takes my finger, and she starts leading me around the, the hospital, showing me all these toys and, and going from place to place. And finally, she comes over, and there's a lady sitting down on the chair, and she has me to sit down, and the lady's sort of across from me, and, and Laney's got my finger in her left hand. She puts her hand on this other lady's uh, leg, and... and she knew the lady was sad, and so I asked the lady, and if you can imagine, most people down there have a child or grandchild 
that's having cancer. And the lady was, was um, sad because her grandchild was there with cancer. And so I talked with her and prayed with her. And then Laney grabbed my finger and we went on and toured some more toys and things. Another thing that happens when you're a cancer patient and your child is the eating. And Lainey uh, would have to eat so she could have her, have her uh, strength. But there also came that time where her food would not stay in her. And that was a source of, uh, of a lot of issues with Lainey during this time. But the chemo was nice because, uh, for Lainey because when she was too weak and too tired, she could be in this little wagon getting her chemo, and then you can see her because her immune system would be weak. She would have to have a mask on to protect herself from, from everybody else's germs. And so there Lainey was, and, and <clears throat> there were a lot of things that we did during that time. For instance, there were t-shirts that said, Love for Lainey, and, and this was one that, we, uh, that was made up, um, Prayers for Lainey. There were a lot of things that people did during that time. And, and I'm not sure how I got this role, but, but I became sort of the spokesperson for Brandon and Tessie and kept people updated. I had Facebook back then. I don't now, so if you look for me, um, you probably won't find me. But, but all of a sudden, I began to notice that I was receiving friend requests from everywhere, even around the world. People who had heard about Laney or knew of the family, and they were praying for Laney. And I began to think, how can this girl that's not even two years old, or at that time I guess she was two, but people around the world were praying. Who else can cause that to happen in her life? And when Laney first went to Memphis with her family, I called Scott Greer, who was preaching down in the Memphis area and left a voicemail because he was in meetings. And then in between those meetings and a board meeting, he called me back and I explained to him the situation that, that Brandon and Tessie were strong Christian families and it was seven hours to go down there and I could not be there all the time and wondered if, if maybe you would just go and pray with them from time to time. So Scott goes to the board meeting, he leaves, goes home, and his wife Suzanne told him, he said, hey, I want to talk to you about this little girl. And he said, from Missouri? And she said, well, yeah. And, and she's got this, and he said, brain cancer? He said, well, yeah, have I talked to you about this? And he said, no. And she said, well, I'm just burdened with this girl and this family, and they're down here, and, and I just feel like we ought to do something. And he said, well... The board met, and the board said, we are going to adopt that family, and when they're down here, we're going to surround them and pray with them and bring food to them, and one guy would bring quarters so they could put them in the, uh, the snack machines because they were Christians, and they had this support in other areas. The church, New Hope, Christian Church in Bartlett, Tennessee, it was amazing how they came around a family that they had not known. This was the same um, uh, going home, they, they went home, and as several months passed, all of a sudden, Laney had to go to the hospital. So they took her to Nevada, and the, Nevada found out all the things going on with Laney, and they said, we don't have any means to take care of her. Please take her to Springfield. So I go to Springfield and I, I see the family in the room and I went to the doors and told the nurse I needed to go in to see Laney and I walked in the room and, and there Brandon and his mom, Barbara, was, who is a nurse, was in the room and, and Barbara said, this is the same room that back in May of 1985, their oldest son, Scotty, had been run over by a tractor, and he died in that room. And a few minutes later, Laney went limp, and I thought she had died. 
And so Barbara was going to go get Tessie, and I asked her to stay, and I go out there, and as calmly as I possibly could, I go to the room, and after we said our highs, I said, Tessie, I would like for you to come in so we can pray for Lainey. We go through there and had to wait for the doors to open, which seemed like forever, and we go into the room, and as soon as Tessie got to the doorway, she realized something was wrong. The doctor began to tell them that this little tumor that they removed was actually called a seed tumor. What that meant was it had put thousands and thousands of little tumors in Lainey's body. And the reason why she was so sick was because the chemo was doing about 25% of killing the, the cancer but the thousands upon thousands of other tumors kept multiplying. So the decision was made that they would stop chemo on Laney. On November 11th, 2011, hospice, if you're familiar with them, began an angel watch. This is where you go to the room and you know that the person is not going to survive. It's final. It's time for that person to pass. And so Tessie and Brandon's family were gathered. There was times of praying, singing, reading scripture, and just simply loving on Laney. And in the early hours of November 12th, Brandon and Tessie were laying beside Laney as she breathed her last. I have no photos of what took place next. But in their living room, we all gathered in a circle as the funeral director came and prepared Laney's body to be taken to the funeral home. And then Brandon came out carrying Laney to the funeral director's vehicle. And later that morning, I called Scott Greer and told him that Laney had passed and that they would like for him to bring the message. After Laney was buried, they released balloons. She was buried by her great-grandma Cena and by her uncle Scotty. And then Joni, I didn't even know she could draw, but she drew this picture of Laney in her John Deere hoodie. And so I took it down to Hobby Lobby because that's where you go to get frames unless you, you know, so they put a barnwood frame around that. And today that picture hangs in the nursery at Park Street Christian Church in El Dorado Springs. Charles Spurgeon in his sermon on August 25th, 1861, titled The Infallibility of God's Purpose says these words, If we study man and make him the only object of our research, there will be a strong tendency in our minds to exaggerate his importance. And in this series that we began last Sunday, Open Doors, Open Wombs, we will cross paths with the life of Job many times. And so I want to share with you just some passages of Scripture from Job that Job speaks about in his desperate condition of all the sufferings that he went through. In Job chapter 1, we, we find after seeing Job's grief, after he had lost all his wealth, after he had lost his children, and now he had lost his health, he says these words, it says, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. And Job's wife was watching Job suffer as he's taking a piece of pottery and scraping his wounds. And she began to be desperately concerned about his well-being and she said are you still maintaining your integrity curse God and die 
And Job's friends came from afar and they came to visit him. And for the first seven days, everything was great because they kept their mouths quiet. But then they began to just interrogate Job, his integrity. And they began to proclaim how he had sinned in secret or, or some way. And finally, Job in Job 13, verse 15, and I would suggest you circle this in your Bible. It says, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Yet I will argue my ways to his face. But the friends who had come to comfort and console Job did very little of comforting and consoling. They kept telling him, Job, if you would just simply confess your sins, all this stuff would go away. And finally, in Job's desperation and in his plea that they were wrong, he begins in chapter 19 of Job saying these words. It says, Then Job answered Bildad, and said, how long will you torment me and break me in pieces with words? These ten times you have cast reproach upon me. Are you not ashamed to wrong me? And even if it be true that I have erred, my errors remain with myself. If indeed I magnify yourselves, or if you magnify yourselves against me and make my disgrace an argument against me, know that the God has put me in this wrong and closed his net around me. Behold, I cry out violence, but I am not answered. I call for help, but there is no justice. He has walled up my way so that I cannot pass, and he has set darkness upon my paths. He has stripped me from my glory and taken my crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side, and I'm gone, and my hope has he pulled up like a tree. He has kindled his wrath against me and counts me as his adversary. His troops come on together. They have cast up their siege ramp against me and encamp around my tent. He has put my brothers far from me and those who knew me are wholly estranged from me. My relatives have failed me. My close friends have forgotten me. The guests in my house and my maidservant count me as a stranger. I have become a foreigner in their eyes. I call to my servant, but he gives me no answer. I must plead with him with my mouth for mercy. My breath is strange to my wife and I am a stench to the children of my own mother. Even young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All my intimate friends abhor me and those whom I loved have turned against me. My, my bones stick to my skin and to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. Have mercy on me, have mercy on me, O oh, you, my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Why do you, like God, pursue me? Why are you not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know my Redeemer lives, and at the last He will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet my flesh, I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. Have you been there? I'm not sure anybody has suffered the way Job has suffered. Uh, Tim Hill is a general overseer of the Church of God where he leads uh, international uh, ministries of over 8 million people uh, with nearly 42,000 churches and, and 187 countries and territories worldwide. And, and Tim Hill is, has written at least a dozen books and he has written over 150 songs. I heard him sing a song one time, so I got a hold of him and asked him, if I could sing that song, so if you would bear with me, I'm going to sing that song. What have you done to deserve all this? Curse God and die. 
What advice for a man who had trusted God most of his life. But then Job speaks as he stands among his broken down domain. In the midst of it all, I shall stand and not fall and bless his name in the midst of it all in the midst of it all I found hope that will never let me fall Should the time ever come when everyone bows their head to cry, and when man has done all that man can do, and I'm left alone to die, oh, but even then, when I'm surrounded by Affliction's greatest pain In the midst of it all I will stand and not fall And bless His name In the midst of it all In the midst of it all What about you? Do you have the strength of Job when you encounter trials and tribulations? Where would you be if you had lost all your wealth? And where would you be if you had lost all ten of your children? And what would you do if it was your husband who was in pain and anguish and you were watching him suffer? I would like to suggest three things that we can do in the midst of all our pain and sorrow. 
This title for today, Trusting God While It Hurts. I didn't say when. Because when defines a point in time. But while is a duration of the time that we encounter our pain. And the first thing I believe we can learn about is hope. As Christians, our hope is in knowing that one day we will be raised from the dead and that we will live forever with God in His beautiful kingdom. I mean, Job had children and his health and his wealth restored later, and sometimes we do not have that. His original twin kids did not be restored, but he did have more kids. And while I was leaving El Dorado Springs, Brandon was helping me load the truck and he told me that on the following Monday, Tessie was going to find out if she was carrying a boy or a girl. And a little bit later, we were putting this train set in, my, in the truck. I told Brandon, if you have a boy, I'll give you that train set. Well, Monday came. That afternoon, I got a call from Brandon. He said, Tessie has a baby boy. The problem is it has died in her womb, and we're going to have to induce labor. That following Saturday, I helped with the funeral of Joshua. And I wonder, how much hope can one have when you've lost so much. Brandon and Tessie did have kids. Sadie Joy was after Lainey had died and then Anna and then after Joshua they did have a boy named Carter. I pray for my kids every day. Do you? The second thing that we find from Job is about comfort and strength. Job's friends obviously were quiet for seven days, and that was a good thing. But then when they began to interrogate Job, it was just terrible, the things that they said. And when Brandon and Tessie had come back from Memphis, there were people that actually came to their home, and they said, we're going to pray over your house because there's demons in here, and if you get rid of the demons, Laney will be cured. And everything would be all right. And I wondered, have they never read Job 9 where the same guys that asked Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? And Jesus said, neither, but that God might be glorified. Job's friends got it wrong too. They felt like if Job just sinned and had sinned and repented, everything would be fine. But sometimes everything is not fine. The third thing is that nowhere in Job do we read of his friends praying on Job's behalf or reading scripture to him. And one of the best things we can do when we're in the midst of all of our pain and sorrow, all of our hurts, is to pray to God and read his word so we can have comfort from God. The third thing is prayer and scripture. We need this from our friends. We need it so that we can endure our trials. I guess what I'm here to tell you today is trusting God while hurting means not my will, but thy will be done. God is where he was when Jesus was nailed to a cross. And you may be asking yourself the question, why was darkness over the face of the earth when Jesus died? And I'm here to tell you that it was not an eclipse. My personal opinion is that's the only time we read where God turned His back because He could not bear to see His Son die. Bearing the sins of all of us in His body. He didn't turn his back on Job, and he will not turn his back on you. He is always there to bring you comfort in the times of hurt. 
Maybe today you simply need a church family who will come and wrap their arms around you and love on you when you go through a difficult time. Maybe you have never made a relationship with Jesus Christ and you know today is the day that you need to make a decision to follow Jesus. Maybe you're just hurting and you would like somebody to pray with you. And so at this time, if, if you have any need, would you just come as we stand and sing this closing song? Let's be standing.